We're beginning this morning's sessions this morning's session by listening to the voices of the survivors. This is an integral component in all of our education activities here in the school. And having said that, it is my pleasure to invite the academic advisor of the International Task Force, Professor Dina Poat of Tel Aviv University, to chair today's first panel session on our legacy in hindsight and in foresight. Dina, please come up, and I'd like to invite the three panelists Dr. Yitzhak Erad, Roman Fister, and Dr. Samuel Pizal, to please come up and take your chairs. Good morning. Good morning to all this abundant audience. Uh, it is an honor and a, and a, a pleasure um, to open this uh, day, which we all hope would be uh, a a powerful, meaningful a day of discussions. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for coming. I'd like to acknowledge uh, the presence of so many uh, good friends, of uh, two former presidents of Poland, of Croatia, uh, Avner Shalev, uh, the, the leading force of uh, Yad Vashem, uh, the ambassador of, of Poland, Dorit Novak, head of the school, and all her team, and all the good friends from the ITF and from elsewhere. Um, indeed, <coughs> indeed, this session, this morning session or panel, uh, is about the voice of uh, the survivors. And as we look at them, and I will introduce them uh, in a minute, uh, one by one and address them with the uh, uh, questions. Uh, as we look at them and we see uh, the, the participants, these three participants, we could have perhaps chosen others uh, with, uh, with the achievements as they have. But as we look at them, the achievements uh, they had after the Holocaust, the, the energy, the, the intellect, the, the activity and the creativity that they demonstrate, when we look at them and take this into consideration, we can begin, begin thinking about the loss, about what has been lost, the amounts, the, the, the floods and rivers of uh, energy, creativity, <coughs> culture, ideas uh, that have been lost uh, during the Holocaust. Um, <clears throat> I would like to open this session uh, by quoting, it has never been translated, so you will have to trust me, uh, by quoting a known poet in Israel, Dalia Rabikovich, who said more or less the following. She said that the Holocaust was like a hand grenade. The hand grenade exploded, and each one of us, not necessarily survivors, each one of us, and for generations to come, got his private little piece, his private shrapnel, and is carrying it with himself in his body. And this little shrapnel is hidden in all that we do, in the songs that we write, in our poems, in everything we write and we do. And so, and so before, even not knowing it, not being aware of it, the theme of the Holocaust is our central theme in everything that we write, um, we write and we do. And she says, I, Dalia, I am a third generation born in the land of Israel, and still this is what I feel. I would like to um, <clears throat> ask our three panelists a question we have been discussing before. And this is, do you feel, do you feel that uh, indeed Dalia Rabikovich is right? That this private shrapnel uh, is in everyone, not only in survivors. And what do you think about the possibility? Um, you were, Dr. Pizar, worried about it and mentioned it in your introduction to Kaddish, to your Kaddish. What would happen when the generations of survivors will not be with us? How would we educate them? 
How are we going on with the work, the fabulous work that is being done? How would this be uh, continued? Uh, the first to answer uh, will be uh, Dr. Tolka uh, Itzhak Arad. Um, everyone knows him here. He doesn't need an introduction. But let me remind you of what Henry Kissinger said once when uh, uh, he was about to speak and uh, the chairperson said, well, we have here a speaker who doesn't need an introduction. And he said, yeah, perhaps I don't need, but it's very nice to have one. <laughs> so, um, Tolka was born in Lithuania. Uh, during the war, he was in the ghetto in Svenchian where he, uh, he and his friends organized uh, an underground group with which they left for the forest in 1943, when he was barely uh, 16 and something. Uh, they joined Russian partisans, then they joined Lithuanian partisans, then he joined the Red Army. He was fighting all along. Then he came to the land of Israel and continued the fighting uh, during the War of Independence in many ways. He was chief officer of education in the ITF, in the Israeli Defense Forces. He has his PhD from Tel Aviv University uh, about Vilna, uh, Vilna during um, the war and the, the Holocaust. And from 1972 to 1993, these are 21 good years, uh, he was the chairperson of the uh, Yad Vashem executive. Tolka, please. And I'll introduce uh, our other panelists uh, in the continuation. Please. Thank you, Dina. First of all, I would like to add that I lost two of my parents during the Holocaust, three grandparents, over 40 uncles and aunts and cousins, the, the close family. And uh, then about... Uh, the question about how we survivors can see about how the Holocaust will be remembered, will be taught, after we will not be, be more active or there will be no more survivors. As an historian, it's hard for me to say how it will be in the future. We hardly know what happened exactly in the past. But still, uh, Doubtless, the remembrance of the Holocaust will change its character. It will not be the, the same, because uh, the survivors were, first of all, the driving force behind the remembrance. They were the first who immediately, although during the Holocaust, in the ghettos collected material to, for the future generation to know what happened, they were the first who established the historical commissions in Poland and other places, in the DP camps, and they were those who initiated all the commemoration ceremonies in, in Israel and all the other countries. So after them, the, whole, the, the remembrance and the teaching of the will change its character. Hard for me to say how. But what we, what we as survivors can have, have to do, and we did, and we continue to do, it, to, to do it, is to leave for the future, first of all, our stories, our testimonies, what happened, our diaries, even our research. I think it's very important that uh, we survivors can even, those who, who witnessed the Holocaust can also write the history of it, trying to write it objectively as, as much as uh, possible. So this is what we can leave, and let the future generation decide how in which way they will be the good they will continue the remembrance and the teaching of it. But even before speaking about the future, I would just say that even now, as long as we, when we still live, there are still the people, historians, who deny the Holocaust. It's hard for us, the survivors, who witness it, to understand this phenomenon, but the very fact that it exists. Recently, for the last years, we, there's an, a new phenomenon. Not the denying of the Holocaust, but to trying to, the, to diminish, to erase, I would say, even the uniqueness of the Jewish Holocaust. A theory of, of two Holocaust. I, I am a member, I was a member, excuse me, I'm no more, a member of the Historical Commission of, in Lithuania, also in Latvia, a short time. 
and uh, they came out with this with the with the conclusion that there were two Holocausts. There was a Jewish Holocaust, who are guilty, of course, the Germans, and there may be a few hundred Lithuanians. And there was a Judo Bolshev, it was a Lithuanian Holocaust of the we are guilty, the Judo Bolshevist. And then they had to find some Jewish partisans, I among them, who are trying to find that we are guilty in some crimes that we committed against Lithuanian people to the board as partisans. I can say you no crimes were committed by us. We, we supported. As partisans, we, we were very interested that the local population will support us. Without Partisans cannot be active without support of the local population. And therefore, we tried to do. Of course, they were collaborators, and with collaborators, we were fighting. But uh, so it's not only denying the Holocaust, the rewriting of the, Hitler, of the Holocaust worries me more than the denial. The denial did not have deep roots. I think it didn't succeed. But the double Holocaust, and then if I will have time later more speak about the decision about the 23rd of August as a memorial day, uh, memorial day for all the victims of totalitarian regimes, which doubtless has a meaning to their unique story of the Holocaust. But uh, let's leave for the uh, later. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Tolka. Um, the same question will go My on. My nickname, Tolka, in the party, as I was called Tolka. <laughs> <laughs> and when I came to Israel, I told the story that it was upon us, and so it became Tolka and Tolka, and my grandchildren, my grand grandchildren, I ever are calling me Ang Saba Tolka. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, we, we go on to uh, our next, uh, next speaker, uh, Mr. Roman Frister. And before introducing him, I'd like to remind you, uh, our panelists and, and the audience, uh, about um, a, a phrase uh, that I quote, uh, everyone must have caught it, from Alan Finkelkraut's fabulous uh, lecture. He, uh, there were so many coins of speech, terms of speech that you could have taken from, uh, uh, from his speech, and one of them was, the Holocaust is not an event, it is a pattern. It has become a pattern, not an event, namely not looking into the history, but today it's a pattern and you as survivors uh, uh, have, have to deal with it. Memory, he says, has become a grievance, like a burden and not a, only, only a duty. Um, Roman Frister, well, Roman Frister was a uh, was born in Poland um, to a well-to-do family. Uh, one son to his uh, parents, so he started life well, normal and well, and then the world up turned upside down. And uh, the long list of uh, camps, death marches, hard labor camps that he went through that included Auschwitz and Mauthausen at the center, um, it is a very long one. Uh, he came to Israel in 1957. He was, for many years, for decades, uh, a member of the editorial uh, of one of our most important uh, dailies, uh, Haaretz, a very influential one. Um, and he still is affiliated to, uh, to this uh, a newspaper and to another one uh, in Poland. He taught. Uh, journalism and uh, headed for many years a very good school for journalism here. Uh, and what can I say? The, his book, uh, his book, A Self Portrait with a Scar, uh, really scars the reader. It is so uh, open and courageous, and I think we'll speak about it when we get to our second question. But this book and his other ones were translated into many languages and this book in particular to at least uh, 11 ones. A Roman, please. Uh, sorry for calling you Roman, it's okay. Yeah. Well, Tolka Roman, it's okay. Yeah, that, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I thought. Okay. Uh, Tolka said that uh, he lost his parents <coughs> during the Holocaust. I get it. <coughs> sorry. <coughs> Tolka said that he lost his parents uh, during the Holocaust, so did I. But I didn't lose a very important thing. 
I didn't lost my hope. And I came from uh, the concentration camps into the so-called normal life without hate. And there's two things are my greatest achievements, according to me, uh, in my normal life after the Holocaust. I'm not going to tell you about my experiences during the Holocaust. It's written in my books. I would like to try to answer the question how to pass the knowledge about the Holocaust after people like me will pass away. And it will happen in the next decade. That's, that's for sure. Why so pessimistic? Oh, well, I... <laughs> <laughs> let's say next two decades. <laughs> First of all, I would like to... Uh, I would like to say that uh, our memories, the memories of the survivors, never give the real and the full picture of the Holocaust. Each of us mm -hmm. lived his own Holocaust. And so things happen by his own eyes. Somebody else <coughs> saw the same things by other eyes and judged what happened by other means. So I don't think that we, the survivors, the last generations of survivors, are the only mean, the only way to pass to the next generations the knowledge oh, about the Holocaust. And I think that what's written about the Holocaust in a scientific way, it's uh, even more important than uh, direct contact oh, between the survivor and the young generation. I know that when a survivor has the possibility to speak <coughs> uh, to people and uh, to make a very good contact with, with people, uh, it's very important. But I say again, every one of us saw only one part of the Holocaust, his own Holocaust. I think that the biggest crime of the Nazis beside of killing the six million Jews, was the killing of our souls. And I think to kill a soul is not a less crime, not a minor crime, comparing to kill the body. And in many ways, the Nazis did kill our souls. And I know it exactly. Here comes the problem, I think uh, with Sam we shall talk about it, is the solidarity of the Jewish people. Well, I didn't ask that question okay. yet. Okay. One, one, of the, one of the problems is the solidarity of, of the people, of all the prisoners, in, in our case also the Jewish prisoners. And I say that unfortunately, According to my experiences, there was no solidarity. Uh, I'll tell you about one single solidarity and morals go together. I remember my father dying and uh, other, under his uh, mattress there was half a loaf of bread. And he was, uh, he wasn't, uh, he, he didn't eat anymore. He was, it was his last day of his life. And I came to visit him and uh, I was hungry. I was 15. And I know, I, I, I knew that he will never eat this, uh, this bread. And then I wanted to take this bread from behind him and suddenly he opened his eyes. And I understood that if I'll take this loaf of bread, half loaf of bread, I'm telling to my father that you are dead. And I couldn't do it. The next day, my father was dead and the half loaf of bread was no more there. 
And that was the end of my moral approach to life in the concentration camp. I got my lesson. And then, years after the Holocaust, I remember I read uh, Jean-Paul Sartre's play, No Exit. And one of the characters there says, hell is other people. Mm -hmm. In the concentration camp, for me, hell was other people. <clears throat> Maybe the Nazis more than the Jews. Maybe. Yeah. I am not talking about Jews. I am talking about. I was in the concentration camp in, in con various concentration camps, not only with Jews. I was with Germans, uh, criminal uh, uh, prisoners, and others, and homosexuals, and uh, with many, many Poles, and mm, even Russian and uh, Greek. So I'm talking about prisoners. I don't differ between Jews and Gentiles in this case. Okay. Uh, after the after after the after the incident with the bread, I understood that uh, Auschwitz. It was in Auschwitz. Auschwitz is is a jungle. In a jungle, uh, usually. Wolves survive and rabbits are killed. I didn't want to become a rabbit and I became a wolf. That's what my book is about. Yeah. And when you are a wolf in the jungle, you, are, you don't know the expression of solidarity. You don't know the expression of morals. You are taking care of yourself and only of yourself. I remember a, an incident when a Hungarian privileged Jewish prisoner raped me in Auschwitz. And then because he didn't want me to live, he didn't want to have a witness, he took with him my cap. And usually, on the morning, uh, in the morning, uh, when uh, <coughs> we went to work, the capos of the Germans used to kill prisoners who didn't have all his equipment, caps and everything. So I was done to, de to die. But I did uh, the wrongest thing you can do in your life. I stole a cap of another prisoner, and somebody else died instead of me. I never looked behind me because I didn't want to see who it was, because I didn't want to live my whole life with the face of the killed man against my eyes. So don't talk about morals and don't talk about solidarity. They killed our souls. That's the greatest crime of the Nazis. And Thank I would like to end what I am going to say now. One small incident. An SS officer in Krakow, the name of Wilhelm Kunde, killed uh, my mother in my presence. I was then uh, less than 14 years old. And in 1967, well, we found this man with the generous uh, help of Fritz Bauer, who was the general prosecutor in Hessen and a social democrat. We found, uh, we found uh, Wilhelm Kunde and he stand trial in Kiel in 1968. And I saw on the bench Wilhelm Kunde, maybe 55, maybe 60 years old. No more strong Nazi officer, just a man with shaking hands. And I couldn't feel hate. 
And I hated myself because I didn't hate him because I thought that I am, I owe my, my mother this hate and I couldn't hate him. And I am, as I said in the beginning, I am glad that I survived the camps still being a man of hope and being a man without hate. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. As I told you, this is the way the, the book is written and it rips your heart. Um, <clears throat> As you understand, we had some discussions before, and the question of Jewish solidarity, solidarity in general, and Jewish solidarity, individual one. We didn't discuss uh, collective communities, countries, the uh, uh, Jewish council. We spoke about men to men uh, and the question of solidarity, uh, especially in, uh, in view or in light of a heated debate that we had in Yad Vashem a while ago when a famous professor spoke like you. Uh, he said that there was, that Jewish solidarity faded away and there was a lot of resistance uh, and a lot of objection in the audience uh, that was made of many people, many survivors who were rescued because someone showed solidarity. And the fact that you did not take the half, the, the half loaf of bread before time showed that, that there was solidarity and family solidarity, though you, you look at it as a, as a turning point. Um, before, uh, before turning to our third uh, panelist, uh, Dr. Samuel Pizar, you said, Roman, that uh, uh, there is never the full story, that the st real story is never really told, uh, and I'd like to remind you of an, an excellent collection of essays by author Aaron Appelfeld, himself a survivor, whose the main theme of which is that survivors do give testimonies and the material is collected and the testimonies are on files in the, the archives, etc. but a testimony uh, is never a full one. It's never the full story. It is the truth, as you say in court, but it's not all of the truth. Um, let me turn to Dr. Samuel Pizar, also born in Poland, uh, he was 10 years old when Poland was, uh, when the war broke out and uh, uh, Poland was uh, divided uh, into two. Uh, he spent six years, six years until uh, the age of a bit more than 16, um, in uh, concentration camps, in a long line of concentration camps, uh, including Auschwitz, and the final one was uh, Dachau from which uh, he escaped and the long range of uh, miracles that happened to him uh, that combined initiative and help from others, is a, each story is a, a book in itself. I liked very much, if I may say so, the proportion uh, in his famous book of uh, Blood and Hope in which the Holocaust takes uh, about a third. And then the two other thirds are the life after the Holocaust uh, as you said, Roman, the hope. Uh, as um, Shmuel Pizar is, uh, is saying so well, the, the energy, the will to live, the achievements. Uh, Shmuel Pizar ha has written a long list of books uh, on economy, for instance. One of them, the most famous one, Coexistence and Commerce, has been translated into about 20 languages. He got many awards, uh, honorary PhDs, He's a famous international lawyer, and as he told me yesterday, he has two people living within himself. And perhaps you'll say, the 16 years old boy that escaped Dachau and an international lawyer. So please, would you uh, relate uh, to the questions of what would happen after the Holocaust, God forbid, are not here, and the question of solidarity.
Ladies and gentlemen, I have a bit of a problem at conferences of this kind, and I must say at I'm the, the outset... I'm the troublemaker? No. <laughs> no, you're not a troublemaker. You are my brother. But I have not come out of the Holocaust with the same mentality as you. You see, my problem is that I was so young when all of this happened to me, between the age of 12 and 16, that there are two individuals that live within me, that cohabit within me. And they are often in conflict. One is you. That is to say the um, young adolescent, skeletal, with shaved head, with sunken eyes. Um, and the other one, because I was so young and there was still time to resume life um, fully and completely, the over-sophisticated uh, intellectual and men of affairs and men of action. And the two, uh, it's very difficult for me to keep coexistence between the two of them. Um, so, um, the um, question of solidarity, for example, I see it very differently. differently. I, I beg to differ. It was not like that. If you speak about Jewish solidarity during the Holocaust, you are presumably thinking about it collectively and individually. Mm -hmm. At the collective level, uh, Jewish solidarity in the diaspora um, Whatever you say about it, the diaspora was very far away from Nazi-occupied Europe. Um, the diaspora may have done a little more to help, but it was not so simple because they didn't know. And when they knew, they knew not because it was impossible to understand. And even when Karski went to the United States to tell everybody. Uh, Just for those who do not know, yeah, Jan, we're speaking, of course, about Jan Karski, the delegate of the Polish underground that went out of Poland to the Allies to tell them about what happened in Poland and about the final solution to the Jews. Sorry. So that even if they, some of them heard about it, they knew not, they couldn't understand. And when they understood, it was almost too late. And the reason for it was that it was unimaginable. Such things had never been done by human beings to other uh, human beings. Even we didn't understand in the beginning, in the camps. Um, and... Um, when they understood, they probably tried, but it is too hasty to make such judgments mm -hmm. collectively. Mm -hmm. And it is even more hasty to do it individually. Because, yes, lives depended on that little piece of um, gray mm -hmm. bread. But we were all hallucinating every day, every moment, from hunger, from illness, from pain, and from anguish. And it was um, true that there was a certain lack of solidarity occasionally because, as everywhere else, there were some bad eggs among us. Amongst us. There was the occasional man who denounced. It was rare. 
whenever we could, we would lynch him. There were those who became kapos. That is true. That also existed. But by and large, there was solidarity. And even if there was some selfishness, one has to look at it with humility and with compassion because it was impossible to be heroic at every moment. And I remi remember in Auschwitz one day in my solitude I saw a man who had been a friend of my parents in Poland, in the city of Bialystok. His name was Henek, and he was in his 30s. I was 14 at the time, and I ran towards him, thinking to myself, my God, at least someone whom I know, someone would console me. And he, um, when he realized who I was, and this was a man who was like an uncle. He would come to the home um, for the Shabbat dinner. We were not very <coughs> religious. He would bring me chocolate and halva. Uh, and I had a very good memory. And his attitude was, get away from me. Um, and I was, for a moment, in shock because I said, how can that be? The same man. But I had already had enough experience at Majdanek and even at Auschwitz to understand how difficult it was to try to suddenly, in this incredible struggle for life from minute to minute, to have a little kid on your back whom you have to help as well. And I forgave him. And uh, not much later, <clears throat> things for me went rather better because um, I was induced into a commando that was cleaning the cattle trains <laughs> that were bringing the people from all over Europe. And in the rubbish, I could find a piece of sausage and a piece of bread and even um, a box of sardines. And I went out of my way to throw him some food to help him. He didn't last very long. But my point is, it is um, painful as much as I respect the story that you have told to make a judgment that we lost our morality, we uh, lost our loyalty, that we lost our souls. We did not. Um, so um, that is Thank you. direct testimony yeah. because, you know, I am not here to play the intellectual. I cannot afford the luxury of the admirable Professor Finkelkraut, who can discuss a very important subject as he did yesterday in philosophical and academic terms. It was brilliant, but the little one in me <laughs> has problems with that, and I am trying to keep a human balance. Now I come to your first question. And here again, maybe this is not the little one that is speaking, but the more modern one. Um, um, it is, of course, true that we survivors are not here for long. We are disappearing one after the other. And very soon, History will begin to speak at the very best with the impersonal voice of the um, 
with the um, novelists, with the researchers, with the historians, and at the worst, with the voice of the revisionists and the demagogues. And that process has already begun, and it is inevitable, and that is what um, um, is in store for us. And yet I think that um, um, the um, process of remem remembrance, the process of alerting our fellow man to what had happened and what could happen again is one that can and must and will go on. Mm -hmm. And it will probably take on um, somewhat different forms in the hands of new generations. But it will go on because it is not only a process that is important for Jews, it is a process that is important for everybody. Because what happened to us is already well known. But when we look at the inflamed world of today, which reminds me a little bit of the inflamed world into which I was born in Poland, Mr. President. Um, I have this feeling that we are at the edge of the abyss, all of us. And the problematic of our memory is something that is becoming and has become universal. It concerns all people, those who have known genocides or those who have not known genocides, because we humans now have the means for the final solution for humanity as a whole. With new blasts of toxic gas, uh, nuclear missiles, and atomic mushroom clouds. And for this reason, the lessons that are buried in what we have lived, what the two of my fellow survivors have said, and what, have I, what I have told you, and we see things in different ways, but fundamentally we tell a very important story. All of that is essential for the survival of the human species. Yeah, thank you. Well, <laughs> thank you so much. I think it's only fair that I come back to Tolka because Tolka, you know, is a, a disciplined person. <laughs> he was asked a question and he answered it. And then the two other speakers went on to the second question already, so it's only fair that I come back to him, and I, uh, and please answer the one on Jewish solidarity. I am disciplined because I was 30 years a soldier, so for me a question is a, is a question, not to go further. Okay. Uh, I was lucky not to be in the camps, not in, not in Auschwitz and other camps. I was in the ghettos, I was in the forest, in partisans, and so on. So, uh, I can understand the uh, Roman's uh, uh, approach to solidarity. I can just tell you that such cases, even much worse, were in the camps of Soviet war prisoners. That was cannibalism. People eat. So it is, when you speak about solidarity among Jews, it's uh, more a question of solidarity between human beings. Not only in such conditions Jews behaved Mm -hmm. better or worse than, uh, than others. But my personal experience is uh, much more, uh, is different. 
uh, for me, it's quite hard to to say to the division between solidarity between the Jews and not only the individuals, because I think if a ghetto where there were 20,000 Jews, 12,000 legal, which received some mm -hmm. scarce ra rations of food, and there were 8,000 illegals, and with the scarce rations were divided between the 20,000, not only before the 12,000, it is solidarity. I don't expect solidarity if uh, women uh, smuggled, smuggled to the gate of the ghetto two potatoes and gave her, them to the, her, to her uh, hungry children and not to the neighbor children. I don't expect such a solidarity. You cannot expect, we cannot even demand such solidarity. So what I can say from my personal experience, when I escaped in the end of September 41, when 3,000 of my township, Shvinchonis, Shvinchonis today, were taken to the pits, to the pits in near uh, Novoshvinchana, or now Shvinchonia, I call today, and I escaped, and I wandered through, through Belarusia. And the people in Belarusia, Jews, were said, if any refugee arrives, you have immediately to hand them over to the local police. If no, you will be executed. And I went to, to six, six, seven small townships, and everywhere I knocked on the door of a Jew, and they gave me to stay overnight. But told me, okay, here is a small, very little people. You will be meet, recognized, go further. And then I reached a, a place called Glubokoye in Belarusia, which about four, 5,000 Jews were there. I, I just knocked in a, in a door, a woman opened me and told me, look, I escaped from Shvinchonis. Can I stay here? She told me, okay. And with the small, the few food that they have, they divided with me and I stayed there two months with them. Later, I went back to Shvinchonis, a long story, but I met a lot of solidarity. I can say one more story which was a personal. I and my friends, youngsters, age of 15, we smuggled arms into the ghetto. And two of our boys were caught by the Lithuanian police, taken to the German Gestapo, and we knew that there are no heroes that can face the, the, the questions in the Gestapo, the torture. And they will say that, that there are other people in the ghetto, youngsters who have weapons and so on. So we decided, we had fed the youngsters, a small underground group, decided in the night we shall escape from the ghetto. It was not, 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 not a problem to escape. We take out our arms and decided to this, to, uh, and, and met in uh, some point, and then the 300,000 Jews which were left in Shvinchonis ghetto came around us and said, okay, you will escape, you will survive, tomorrow the Germans will come, will not find you, they will execute uh, the whole ghetto. And we were youngsters, you know, if we stay, it's our death. If we escape, we endanger the whole ghetto. Finally, we decided to stay, to stay not in danger of the ghetto. It's also a question of solidarity, because we know. So my, I think that, uh, like Robin started, everyone has his story and his conclusions. My story is much more, I am more optimistic about solidarity, and I think that there was, in the ghettos was a lot of solidarity. There were uh, food kitchens and, and, and uh, other things which helped each other. Refugees, was, in each ghetto were hundreds of refugees and they found some, some place where to shelter to stay and they found some scarce food. But still, I hope in solidarity among human beings, I hope especially among uh, the Jewish. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, I'd like to to round up this uh, question of uh, solidarity and also the uh, the question of uh, uh, what uh, how would activities and awareness uh, uh, look like when the survivors are here no more. 
uh, with a quotation of, from uh, another poet, and this is uh, Abba Kovner. I wrote his biography, so where, wherever you press me, a, a quotation from Abba Kovner comes out. So, <clears throat> and he said, uh, he said the following, the slaughtered Jewish people speaks in silence and in words to the living Jewish people, us and those who, who lived outside Europe to which uh, Shmuel you, you referred. You who are unable to save us, listen now with all your hearts to our testimony. It is all that remains of our lives. And this killed um, Jewish people says to the living one, can you spare a moment to think of us Innocent and crime and unashamed. Innocent of crime and unashamed. This is what he wrote uh, when looking at the whole picture. As uh, you all said, it's not only a Jewish question, the question of human behavior, human beings under pressure, other nationalities, other circles, other people. It was a time of test to everyone. And he concludes regarding the Jewish people, innocent in crime and unashamed. Um, let me go on now to ask <clears throat> each of the participants one more question. Now not a general one, one not a, a addressed to the three of you, but each of you wanted to speak about something specific. Uh, we have here a historian, a journalist, a lawyer, um, uh, each of them would like to speak about a certain point that he's either concerned about or would like to share uh, its answer uh, with all of us. Um, I'll start uh, uh, with Tolka again. Uh, and uh, Tolka would like to speak about a problem, uh, an international uh, matter that is on the table of the European, uh, all the, the European uh, community. And it is the question of the 23rd uh, of August, please. And each of you has, I regret to say, five minutes. Okay. <laughs> I told you he's disciplined. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, st uh, I would like again to start with the problem of rewriting, the, rewriting of the history. It started, which I mentioned before, about the story of two holocausts, which I'm very worried about it. Yes, Lithuanian people suffered from the Soviet regime. Tens of thousands of more Lithuanians were deported, were killed, found their death in deportation. Definitely, they have to study their history, what happened during the Soviet 50 years of the of Soviet rule in, in, in Lithuania. But to compare this to the Jewish Holocaust is a falsification of the story. This should be remembered. After all, after 50 years of Soviet rule, Lithuania was able, in one, during a shorter time, to establish a new state, a democratic state. They have the intelligentsia, they have the economic basis, they have the language, they have everything. So. It cannot be com to compared to the Holocaust of the, of the Jews. So, okay, S please study, research, your, write your history, but don't compare it to, to the story of the Holocaust of the Jews. Yes, what happened in Lithuania was a suffering, was under Stalinist regime, but not in Holocaust. Then go further. The 23rd of uh, August, the international, the, the day of, uh, of commemoration of the victims of the terrorist, of the, of the dictatorship of the uh, regimes. And a consequence to it, the, just putting the Soviet Union on the same level of guilty of the beginning of the Second World, of the Second World War. Just this. What I can say definitely, Stalin was not a lover of peace, but 23rd of August, 39, 
when he signed the Ribbentrop-Molotov Agreement, and this was the, the date of, of the 23rd of August, Stalin didn't want a war. Again, not, not before he was a piece of love. He didn't have an army. After the purges of 1937, 38, when 80% of the command staff of the Red Army were executed by Stalin, yes, he know he doesn't have an army, and he wanted, so he, he wanted, he was afraid of a war, and Stalin' purpose was that what in the 38th to conclude an alliance with England and France to stop the aggression of Nazi Germany, and he preached for an, such an agreement which will prevent German further aggression toward Poland and uh, other countries. But one day, when there was still a an, an commission, French-English commission in, 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 in Moscow, dealing, discussing the problems, and one day Stalin got up in the morning and there was a Munich agreement. Munich agreement which sold Czechoslovakia to, the, to Nazi Germany by Chamberlain and by Daladier. Chamberlain, the British, and the, 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 the French. What I can say definitely, Stalin, after the conclusion after this was that the purpose of the capitalist states, England and France, is to turn Nazi Germany against him. And he was afraid of a war. Therefore, he went to the agreement of Ribbentrop Molotov. Without the Munich agreement of September 38, there wouldn't be Molotov agreement of the 23rd of August 39. And then the war wouldn't start. So the, to, the connection of this date with the memorial date of the victims of the totalitarian regimes is a political game by some countries we initiated. And I would say the European Parliament, without understanding, I'm sorry to say it, the, the whole meaning of, the, of this period again, accepted it as a, as a day. I am not against a day to, of commemoration of the a Memorial Day for the victims of the totalitarian regimes. But by fixing the 23rd of August, it has a, a political purpose, not a humanitarian educational uh, reason. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you, Tolka, so much. You, you can understand by now that we had long discussions before by telephone and uh, by in meetings. Uh, what, is, what could we squeeze in in the time uh, that uh, we had? And certainly this question of uh, uh, keeping uh, the awareness that the Holocaust was unique, but still not ignoring and being sensitive to other catastrophes catastrophes was on uh, our table and on uh, our mind. And what uh, Tolka really summed up was our conclusion in, in the conversations that we had that certainly uniqueness and other catastrophes, but it, looking at each of them in its historical context, studying its details and not leveling all of them to one to emerged, uh, emerged blurred picture in which all victims of all totalitarian regimes have um, a, a suffered from the same regime, the same ideology. It's like forgetting history, uh, in fact. Uh, now we go on to, to Roman. Uh, Roman wanted uh, two minutes. I think that he would like to answer, uh, but you have five minutes. Uh, and you can divide them if you wish. Uh, the question he wanted, his special question was, uh, since he has uh, extensively lived in, uh, uh, in Poland uh, for uh, some years, um, he would like to speak about uh, the visits of Israeli youngsters to Poland and also to, to have his two minutes, please. <coughs> well, first of all... Uh, microphone, microphone. <coughs> First of all, I would like to say that uh, some people uh, tend to see the uh, visits of uh, Israeli youngsters in Poland as the main purpose of the visit, not so much to teach uh, Holocaust, but to strengthen their national feelings. I strongly condemn this uh, trend. 
Uh, it's very important for Poland, and I don't know why not to Germany, to Nazi camps in Germany, there are not Mauthausen in Austria, why only to Poland? Uh, I think it's very important that uh, those young people see by their own eyes how it looked, uh, have a possibility maybe always somebody of the surviving pe people goes with them and uh, to listen to him on the spot, it has his, it's a very important impact. But I must say that my experience, and I met two or three uh, groups of youngsters, Israeli youngsters in Poland, my personal experience was not the very best. Uh, I think that many groups are not uh, enough prepared before they go uh, to Poland. Many see that as a, a kind of an excursion to see another country, to enjoy life. I have seen them uh, going uh, at the, in the evening to the discotheque. I don't think it's proper. Uh, they may go to discotheque in Tel Aviv. They don't have to go to Krakow or to Warsaw. Uh, I also, I give you an example. Uh, one group I was with uh, got his uh, breakfast in Warsaw, very close to the uh, to the ghetto heroes uh, monument monument uh, in Warsaw. So they get eggs and sandwiches, and they sat on the monument and ate the eggs and the, and the sandwiches, and they left the leftovers on the monument. And I spoke to the man who was with us young people and asked, how is it possible? And he answered me, what do you want? They have their breakfast, they have to eat. That was the answer. So I don't say, that that's the pattern. Exactly. That's not the pattern. But you know what happens. The pattern is correct and is seen also by the Polish population as correct. But those cases mm -hmm. are doing so much wrong to us that they should be eliminated totally. And the, one of the problems is, I think so, that there is no one organizer of uh, those excursions, if I can uh, yeah. tell it so, or name it so, to, to Poland. Okay. Um, various organizers, and uh, that's, I think, one reason that it not always works like it should be worked. Now to should your two done. minutes. And now to your two minutes. Okay. Please. Now, I, my two minutes. My two minutes are, uh, Orit is here, Orit. somewhere, okay. With Orit we went, uh, I think it was a year ago, with a group of uh, grown-up persons from Cincinnati and made a journey of five days uh, around Poland. And uh, after they went back uh, to Cincinnati on the Yom Kippur sermon, uh, the sermon was uh, dedicated to this visit uh, in Poland, and it was called Don't Judge. And was based upon a short story I would like to tell you now. And this is a lesson for those who will teach Holocaust after we shall not be here. Don't judge, and how difficult it is to judge. In 1944, in one of the camps, a Jewish physician got an order to kill 1,500 Jewish prisoners. Uh, the commander said uh, they will be not shot because they need the bullet, bullets uh, for the army. So they'll be killed by poison. Those physicians injected to 700 people phenol, it's a poison, into the heart their heart, and they, of course, were taken, dragged immediately to, to the mass grave. And then to 800 other people, he said, now you go out this way, you will fall down and play a dead. 
I shall not inject you the prison. You will be dragged to the mass grave. It's going to be dark in half an hour. We don't have a list of names. You go back to your barrack and you will live. I remember the next day, if the Nazis would get wind of it, they would torture him and kill him in their most terrible way uh, it's only possible. He was treated the next month in the camp as the biggest hero. He, risking his own life, of course, saved the lives of 800 people. In 1946, I was a witness on his trial in Krakow. He was sentenced to death for killing 700 people. Look, only three years, for before, three years ago, he was a hero. Three years later, he was a murderer, a mass murderer. So when you are going teaching Holocaust, be very careful in judging. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. Uh, last question to our last speaker, uh, uh, Dr. Shmuel Pizar. He's the first uh, one, not he's the first one. He's the first, yeah. <laughs> he's the first one from the other side. Um, <clears throat> and my question, uh, of course, uh, we heard and saw uh, your, your wonderful piece of art, and this is Kaddish written to the music of uh, Leonard Bernstein. And I'd like you to, to quote a sentence from this before I ask you uh, about art, the, write, the writing, literature, poetry with music, about the role of art as you can see it now that you have traveled with your Kaddish and uh, inspired people with this, uh, with this work uh, all over the world. How can this enhance uh, awareness and f fine, I would say, memory of the Holocaust? And in one of uh, the sentences that you wrote there, you said, how can one even be sure that the catastrophe was totally man-made? And this is definitely a question for educators. How can we even be sure that the catastrophe was totally man-made when it was so immense and so inhuman and so against all that humanity stood before? And you speak against God and with God. You, you blame him. You forgive him. You ask him to blame you and forgive you. You have a whole dialogue with God and you say, we know from the book of Genesis how wrathful a God you can be when you lose your, your notorious temper. Please. <laughs> Madam Chairman, you're contradicting yourself. Because Could be. Earlier you said that you're going to give us an opportunity yes. to speak about something we want to speak. Exactly. And um, yet you're imposing this question. You can choose another one yes. right no, no. away. No. No, no problem. No, we, we, are, we are not quarreling. <laughs> no, no. But you see, I have a very Five minutes. sensitive problem. Okay. Share it with us. You have activated me to speak about God. Yeah. And my friend and fellow survivor, the chief rabbi of Israel, has just arrived. No. And I have to be very careful that I don't get excommunicated from the Jewish faith. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but we, we know Rabbi Lau, and he is one of a liberal mind. And you can speak whatever you like. <laughs> Rabbi, do you give me assurance and immunity? <laughs> um, let me touch up your question a little bit. Yeah. Because you've already <laughs> touched on this earlier with me, and mm -hmm. you said, what do you have to say from your experience um, um, to those who say that the survival yeah, was, was largely luck, yeah. hazard, yes. and chance? Yeah. And... I said to you, 
-hmm. and I'm going to get good points in a minute. Mm -hmm. I said, and maybe also divine providence. To which uh, I objected. But, but it is true that in, the, uh, in my symphonic poem, I uh, am just on this side of blasphemy when I say to God, uh, was the Holocaust totally man-made? Because my argument with him on this is that by not being there, by being silent, by being distant, he may have inadvertently sent a signal to the genocidal demons and to a largely uncaring world that killing Jews and other vulnerable minorities was all right, even to this day, mm -hmm. because it is still going on today. So um, um, on the issue of how much was the survival due to God or to chance or to luck or to hazard, uh, it is on this that I want to focus. Please. Um, <laughs> So, uh, of course, all of these three things were in operation. But from my experience at that young age, um, I have to testify that the personal factor, personal action, did play an important role fact. Uh, not everyone put himself, you know, I learned very quickly that uh, God helps only those who help themselves. Um, this is not blasphemy. Uh, God expects us to do something, not just stand there. Mm -hmm. um, so I, being a very young, instinctive animal, in a predatory jungle, I, uh, because I didn't have much going on there, I didn't think. And I think that helped me because most people around me were sitting there or standing and thinking all the time. Um, and I didn't have that capacity. So I was reacting instinctively spontaneously like an animal trying to identify danger and do something. And I will never know, we will never know how much was luck and how mixed it all was, but very briefly because you said five minutes. Um, I will quickly relate to you a passage that I wrote in my book of Blood and Hope. At the age between 14 and 15, I went before Dr. Mengele three times. <clears throat> and by some divine miracle, I made it every time. But the fourth time, I blew it and I was sent to the wrong side. And we were loaded on a truck and we were taken to the gas chambers. And the line was so long that it, we were standing there for hours. And I felt nothing except a very uneasy nausea in my stomach. This is how you feel uh, just before um, death. And um, we were, I would say, not in the gas chamber, of course, but in the antechamber. Mm. And in my habit that I had already learned, I thought, to an art, I decided I've got to do something. So I saw a pail of water standing in the corner with a brush. So I went over, I took the pail and the brush 
and I turned in the direction of the exit where we came from, and I started to clean the floor. And my fellow uh, condemned were in the way, but I did what I could, carefully making my way toward the exit. And when I became, when I came closer, the two uh, SS guards who were standing and uh, with their machine guns at the gate, they kind of became part of my action. It's as if, um, as if they were part of it because one of them yelled at me, Schweinhund, look, there, it's dirty. So I went back and I cleaned that with my nails and I came closer to the exit. And then I was at the exit, and they had gotten so used to me there. <coughs> I must have been there for 10, 15 minutes. That, uh, and I don't know if I was so clever as to induce that in their minds. It's as, if, it's as if I had been sent there to do a job. And when I came to the two steps, I took my pail, I took my brush, I turned around, and I walked out, waiting at any moment to get either a bullet in the head or um, a knock with a steel bar. Nothing happened. And in a few seconds, I was mixed with the population of the camp. Uh, was that luck? Was it chance? Was it hazard? It was either God or me. Yeah. Maybe the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that night in the barrack, when I was lying on my back, <clears throat> in my childishness, I took myself for the young Joseph in Egypt. Joseph telling the Pharaoh a uh, a grandmother tale about seven cows and seven good years and seven bad years. And um, he was scratching the floor. Mm -hmm. And he saved his life. I was thinking to myself, because I had already read the Bible, Rabbi, and uh, I wasn't much uh, of um, a Talmud Hochem, but I knew already something. So I took myself for the young Daniel in Babylon, reading the letters on the wall. On the wall. And uh, by explaining what he had read to King Nabuchadnezzar, he saved his life from the lion's den. And the Thank reason you. I am saying it is because I have a purpose. Um, as we discuss in this very difficult moment, again, for our people, um, um, where Clouds are forming on the horizon once again. Um, we must follow that dictum. Mm -hmm. God helps those who help yes. themselves. We cannot confuse ourselves with such things as we have lost our values or that we were not uh, showing solidarity to one another in the camps. We have to mobilize ourselves for new challenges and new, new, new yeah. uh, risks and dangers. And uh, that lesson is also buried in the Holocaust. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. so,
Uh, well, uh, we don't know, and perhaps uh, these were indeed all together, uh, the luck and the chance and the initiative in God, but we definitely thank them for having worked at the time and have you with us. That's, that's for sure. I'd like to thank everyone, and I'd like to end the, the discussion. You saw that there were uh, different opinions and Avner, uh, and disagreements, and uh, I'd like to end by saying that on the one hand, there was a coin in one of your books or a term that says, spoke about the God of survival, to live. This is the answer, to live by all means. To live by all means. But I'd like to end with a quotation from philosopher, the philosopher Martin Buber who said, yes, but the main thing is not that we live, the main thing is how we live. Thank you very much, all of you.